Okay, we have Coach Drinkwitz, and he will go straight to questions. I'm sure you guys have a few. Okay, in the second row. Hey, you know, over the years recruiting in Missouri, what do you feel like you've learned overall about the state? Obviously, you blazed quite a, quite a trail in the past few years. You know, what do you feel like is the biggest thing you've maybe taken away, recruiting standpoint? Um, I think you got to continue to develop the brand at the University of Missouri. You got to continue to develop uh, the instilled passion um, for for our university. I think there's uh, divided loyalties among, you know, oh, I'm a Cardinals fan, I'm a I'm a Blues fan, I'm a Chiefs fan, I'm a Royals fan, and my answer to all that is, yeah, but we're all Mizzou Tiger fans. You know, we all. Uh, this is a great representation of our state of the 6.5 million people here and so having the opportunity to play for our university uh, should really matter and should really mean something um, and so i think for me just having to build that and uh, really recreate that renewed sense i think has been uh, uh, something that i've learned coach to your right four rows back brandon adams from dog nation when you entered the sec you knew it was going to be a big challenge and since you've been here Georgia, a team that you play every year in your division, has emerged as a national champion. What does that mean to you? You know, what, what do you think about having the national champions in your division? What's the challenge of that like for you? I mean, that's ultimately, the, that's what you're trying to play for every year is the championship. And so you have an opportunity to measure yourself against the best. Uh, you know what it's going to take. Uh, and you also know if you can win your division, then you have an opportunity to play for the championship. That's why for us, our goal is to win the SEC East um, because we know that if you do that, the rest of the season's goals will take care of themselves. Um, obviously, Kirby's done a, a tremendous job of um, establishing the culture. Uh, you can see it throughout his, his program. Uh, you can see it in how he recruits. You can see it in how he plays the game. Uh, you can see it in how his phases of the game complement each other. Uh, you could see it in the fourth quarter as they figured out a way uh, to, to really outplay Alabama down the stretch in the championship game. And so uh, kudos to him in, in that program. And, and now it's our challenge for us to uh, get to that level. Front row here, Coach. Hey, Coach. AP Stead of WHEP, Foley, Alabama. Coach, I wanted to ask you, what is the identity that you're seeking for your team this year? And how do you distinguish to get your starting quarterback? What are the attributes that will help you in your selection? Yeah, you know, for us, um, our motto this year, you know, or for our program is one team, one goal, one and oh. We want to be united as a team, all pointed in the same direction to achieve the one goal that we have, which is to win the SEC East. And the only way to do that is to be one and oh every single day and focus on the things that you have in, in front of you to control. And so that that's um, really what we want the identity and, and the process for our team to be. Um, when you talk about the quarterback, there's really five characteristics that we judge our quarterbacks on. It's toughness, preparation, uh, decision-making, accuracy, and leadership. Those are the things that we expect from our guys on a consistent basis. Um, it, for us, the quarterback is going to reveal himself to the team through toughness and through leadership. Um, how does he handle the, the mental grind of fall camp? the mental challenge of being in a competition every day, knowing that there's no days off. He has to be at his best every single day. And also the, uh, the, the, the leadership aspect of, um, you know, getting your team to the end zone and not really running your own race and not worrying about what everybody else is doing. And so that'll be a real challenge for, for uh, those guys. And, you know, whoever emerges from that competition will be prepared to play in the toughest league in college football. To your right, Coach, second row. Coach, with uh, the way conferences are, conferences are expanding, I mean, do you like the direction that you know college football is headed? And uh, secondly, where where'd you get your shoes? <laughs> so uh, we'll start with the shoes. Uh, a, a friend of mine, Jacob Burkholder, uh, had a pair of these, and I asked him about them, and so he said, "Hey, why don't you why don't you wear a pair of these uh, for SEC Media Days? They're Year of the Tiger Nike Edition." Um, 2022 is the Chinese year of the Tiger, and so what a great way to, to for us, for our team, um, to embrace that. You know, for as far as college football, man, um, you know, I said it in my opening remarks. For me, the 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 
challenge for college football is not NIL, it's not transfer debate, it's not college football expansion or, uh, or, or conference realignment. It's what are the um, frameworks for what we want college athletics to be? What are the frameworks that we want for college football moving forward and who's in charge of making those decisions and who's in charge of doing that? Because then all the other decisions fall in line. Um, right now we've got decision makers who are making uh, decisions based off what's in their best self-interest, which is currently that's the, the right model. Um, but that may not be the best model for college football. Um, I, I don't know, I, and I'm speaking a little bit out of turn here, but I would anticipate that uh, if we're hypothetically thinking about these TV negotiations and TV rights, right? Um, you've got conference commissioners selling them to TV rights, media marketing guys or presidents who are in charge of what? Creating packages for programming. So are they thinking about what's in the best interest of student athletes? Are they thinking about what's in the best interest of college athletics or the principal guiding principles? No, they're thinking about how do I make the deal for my program? What's in the best interest of my uh, TV contract? What's in the best interest? They're not thinking about what's in the best interest of a student athlete traveling from, um, say, you know, the East Coast to the West Coast after a game. So that, that to me is my question. Um, you know, we, we've had a lot of conversations about we need to put guardrails for NIL. We need to put guardrails on college football. What, what do we want college football to be? You know, Coach, uh, Commissioner Sankey said we're on the path towards professionalism, and that's not the path we want to be on. Okay. Then, then who's getting around the table and saying this is what we want the path to be? I, I'm asking because I don't know. I do know that it says without a vision the people perish. Okay, and so we keep going down this path. We're going to look up in three or four or five years and we'll say, well, this isn't where we wanted to be. Well, yeah, that's because we keep making decisions without guardrails. Uh, so I don't know if that answered your question, but as I think about college athletics, that's what I think about. Who are the adults in the room that are saying, no, this is the best interest of, co this is why we have college athletics. This is why we play college football. I hope it's not what Pat Forty uh, wrote in his article, which is it's all about the mighty dollar. I hope that's not it, because that's not never what it was supposed to be about. If that is, then then Coach Kiffin's right. Then we're past amateurism, and we're, we better start getting into when are we, you know, paying players from the TV revenue, which nobody wants to talk about. We'll go right in front of you, fourth row. Coach, uh, Johnny Conn and ABC 3340 in Birmingham, you had a chance to go up against them in the 2020 COVID season, but from your standpoint as a fellow coach in this conference, what makes Nick Saban so successful? Um, I think experience is the best teacher, and wisdom comes from um, shared experiences and having the ability to try and fail and learn and continue to grow. And, and Coach Saban has had the ability to be a head coach at a lot of different places within a lot of different frameworks. And he's figured out what makes him and his program successful and how he operates on a daily basis. I've, been, uh, I've, I've had a, a, a phone call from my DFO that said, hey, I just got a, D a call from Alabama's DFO. Coach Saban's going to call you in the next 10 minutes. Clear your calendar. I mean, the guy has it so cleared out that he, he makes other people clear their calendar for him to call. Um, and so, you know, I think he has a, a process, as he talks about, in place that he's obviously perfected for him and his staff and culture and players. I mean, he's, he's uh, his staff has transitioned multiple times, and yet he still continues to win because he knows how to replicate the success he had. Without having experienced – uh, being in his building or being a part of it, the only thing I can replicate or, or, or take from it is the fact that he is um, experienced uh, with, with his process and he has wisdom based on um, previous experiences. Fifth row. Coach Dan Peck, ESPN 106.7 in Auburn. Uh, you and your team uh, will make the trip to Auburn, first time in Missouri history. Uh, they'll play at Auburn uh, this year. You've, uh, have, you have some familiarity uh, yeah. with, the, uh, with the program. Uh, several of your coaches and analysts 
I have Auburn ties as well. And uh, you are familiar with Coach Brian Harson uh, from your time at Boise. Can you talk a little bit about your relationship uh, with Coach Harson and the impact he's had on your career? Yeah, I uh, owe a, a lot of uh, debt of gratitude towards Brian and Kess. Um, you know, Brian uh, gave me an opportunity to stay at Arkansas State as a co-offensive coordinator and then uh, uh, brought me to Boise and then elevated me to an offensive coordinator position there at Boise and and um, so really gave me a start in this profession uh, outside of Coach Malzahn and, and learned a lot of um, great things about program building and, and culture setting and and uh, the way to attack a job on a daily basis. And, and uh, it's going to be a real challenge, obviously, going to Auburn, uh, a, a tremendous uh, environment. Uh, having played there as a visitor before when I was at Arkansas State with Coach Arson, ironically. Uh, so it'll be a tremendous challenge. Did not realize it was the first time in Mizzou history to be there. So uh, that's a fun fact to share with our guys. And, and uh, yeah, I look forward to a, a great competition. To your left coach, second row. You talked a lot about the culture, both at Alabama, Auburn, going into your third season. What's the culture that you're trying to set at Mizzou? Yeah, I, I think that's a, uh, one of the things that I, I feel comfortable with is that our culture is starting to be set. Um, we, have a core, we have four core values that we live by on a daily basis, always compete, build trust and respect. Uh, do more than what's expected, enjoy the journey. We know that in the, in the, the uh, weight room, we're expected to train with an elite edge, with energy, uh, grit, determination, or details, um, and emotional consistency. We have those things in place. Our players know uh, what the expectation is and how they're supposed to act and how we do it around here, uh, whether that's in the locker room, on the second floor, they understand that, that uh, leave it better than you found it. Please and thank you cost you nothing. Uh, they, they understand that those are the things that matter to us, and, and we believe that if we consistently do those things, we'll end up uh, as, as some other schools in our division with the ability to play for championships. And so um, we're slowly establishing that. I do think, like I said earlier, uh, going into year three, there's a, a, um, a continuity and a, and a foundation in place that uh, will allow us to grow. To your right, Coach, fourth row. What is your thought process and how do you manage the risk when you're recruiting a quarterback like Sam Horn, who's also a really good baseball player as well? You don't worry about the risk, man. You recruit the best players possible that you can get and you live with the results of however it plays out. You know, it kind of ties back to core value number four, enjoy the journey. Uh, Sam's a tremendous baseball player. He's a, a great football player. Um, and we're, we're privileged to have him on our team right now. And, and uh, if, if baseball becomes the path for him, we wish him and his family the absolute best. But if not, then we, we were able to sign a tremendous player and feel like he's going to have a great opportunity to leave a legacy and a lasting uh, mark on our program. So we're excited about it. Thank you very much, Coach. No, nobody asked me about my, whether they want me to 1-7 or 3-6 model. I guess we'll <laughs> save that for next. All right. <laughs>